Next up, we're going to shift from gold into battery metals. It's always such a favorite topic of all of our audience and myself. We're going to be joined now by Battery Minerals Resources. It has significant assets in Ontario's cobalt belt, the Idaho cobalt belt, and it has lithium and graphite exploration in the U.S. as well as in South Korea. All right, we're going to be joined now by CEO Martin Kostwick. He has over 28 years of experience in the mining industry as a mining engineer and a senior executive. Prior to joining Battery Metals Resources, he was president at Arizona Gold for four years. And prior to that, Martin was CEO and director of Rupert Resources. Now, Martin has built a broad base of experience in precious and base metal operations, engineering, exploration, capital projects with various companies, including Luna Gold in Brazil, which is now Equinox Gold, Barrick in Nevada, Tseco Mines at the, Gibral the Gibraltar Copper Mine in British Columbia, and DMC Mining service Services. Martin, it's a pleasure to have you join us here at the Global Mining Symposium. Welcome. I always like to find out where people are joining us from. So where are you situated today? I'm situated at home in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. And how is the weather? Is it some, we, it's our first two guests, one was minus 30 and one was plus 30. Where is well, Tennessee we're, sitting? We're, we're easing into spring now. The flowers are starting to come up and I'm really looking forward to it because we, we actually had snow this year. Uh, more than once, and we just don't like that here in Nashville. <laughs> no, that doesn't fit with the image of Nashville, Tennessee, that's for sure. Well, I'm glad that the crocuses are blooming. So that's listen, right. uh, Martin, I'll turn it over to you, and uh, you have our full attention. Well, thank you very much, Anthony, and, and I want to thank uh, the Northern Miner and the organizers for having me as a part of this forum, and I look forward to sharing our story. Uh, we have a very exciting story uh, uh, for the audience. Um, so I'll just get into it. Uh, Battery Minerals is a, is a new company to the markets. So we've been trading almost for a year now. Uh, we're trading on the TSXV and also on the OTCQB in the U.S. Um, we have a vision, uh, of course, and I'd like to share that with you. And that, that vision is to build upon um, our assets, to build a portfolio of, of producing assets from, um, around the world, and based on the resumption of operations of our most frequent, our most free, uh, recent acquisition, which is the Punataki Copper Mine in Chile. And all of these things really uh, provide our shareholder with a very uh, clear um, exposure to the ever increasing electrification trend that's going on around the world. And of course, that's via the assets and the commodities that our, um, that our assets have. Having said that, we do offer a variety of commodities for our shareholders to have exposure to this global electrification trend. These, these commodities um, that are within our assets, uh, uh, you know, they vary across the spectrum of the type of materials that you would want exposure to. Um, and, and they also vary in terms of the, the, um, the amount that the projects are in development. So from the very early stage uh, lithium asset in, in Nevada, this is more of a brine play uh, for us to uh, our Northern Ontario cobalt assets, which we're currently exploring, our Northern Idaho cobalt asset, which is in a very prolific um, former producing area of cobalt in Northern Idaho, to our two former producing graphite mines in South Korea. Great area to be in, in terms of uh, graphite production and battery production. Um, all the way to our most recent acquisition, which is the Punataki mine, which we, um, on the heels of a best efforts private placement, we acquired the assets of the Punataki mine um, back in May. And Punataki is, is just a tremendous opportunity for us um, um, to transform the company, essentially. It is our goal to transform the company from where we are now, which is a development stage company, into a cash flowing entity and take our shareholders along the way with us. So again, you know, it, 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 um, our, our strategy is not to sit around and, and explore and, 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 and take shareholders' money um, to do that. We have a full, um, we're, you know, our full goal is to get back into production at the Punataki mine. And that is first and foremost, the beginning of our strategy here. So resumption of operations at the Punataki mine, um, based on the, the, uh, the former product, production, uh, the Punataki mine, which has an operating history of nine years, is operating as recently as April of 2020. 
the uh, the operation has the ability to produce between 20 and 25 million pounds of copper for us. And, and so on the heels of that, resuming operations, which our goal is to do that this year, um, we will then turn around and look at that portfolio that, that I just showed you and, and continue developing uh, those assets, continue the aggressive exploration that we're doing in Northern Ontario in our cobalt properties there. We do have a feather in our cap. Um, um, the efforts that we've been making over the years in Northern Ontario, we have outlined a brand new cobalt resource, very high grade of a, a little over a million pounds of, of cobalt. So we look to keep expanding on, on results like that in Northern Ontario. Then we turn our attention um, to our cobalt property in Northern Idaho. It's just a great uh, property, uh, as I said, in a very prolific former producing area, right next to a property that's going into production as a cobalt copper gold mine. will be in production this year. Uh, Gervois is developing that property. Then we start looking at our, our uh, other properties. As I said, lithium is longer term for us. The graphite projects are brownfield and, um, and I think a little bit of cash injection there could produce some very nice uh, value for our shareholders. So really bringing, bringing our shareholders along for this ride, um, I think that the, the catalyst really that they should look for in the coming months is that great opportunity that we're going to have for a re-rating in the markets as we get closer to resuming operations there. Um, so again, the Punataki complex, this is the focus of, of the company primarily right now. As I said, is it a former producing copper mine with about nine years of operating history? Um, it is a great investment for us. And, and I believe that trans, translates into a great investment for our shareholders. And I'd like to share with you why. Um, we were able to uh, we were able to acquire this mine for about fifteen million dollars, and as, and based on the brownfield nature of this operation, it is a, a fairly low risk um, um, oper um, opportunity for us because of the brownfield nature of the operating history, um, with with uh, the strong team that we have down there, the resources that we're outlining. We believe that this is just a low acquisition point for such a tremendous opportunity. Then you start saying, well, what are we gonna do next? Well, we're, we're going to capitalize this and put it into production. Our view of the, the CapEx that's required to put it back in is about 20 million plus or minus, um, depending on working capital needs. So all of this um, plus the short time frame to production really means for us a low investment risk. And I believe that translates to the shareholders as well. Given the operating history, uh, we expect to be producing um, essentially what was done over the last uh, nine years, which is 20 to 25 million pounds of copper a year. At today's prices, looking at at least a $2 margin. So if you think about it in, in, in the whole context of, of this as a project and as an acquisition, if you add up the acquisition costs and the restart costs of about $45 million for a project that's gonna produce 40 to 50 million in EBITDA a year, we just think it's a great investment and a great platform to build a company on. So we are going to use obviously the cash flow from this comp from this operation to help fund um, other other uh, developments around what, that we're looking at right now, um, and to help continue to give our shareholders that exposure to that increasing mega trend of electrification that's going around the world via our commodities. Uh, a little more on, on the mine. It, uh, it is in a very established mining area. It's as opposed to being way up in the Andes Mountains. Um, we have infrastructure here. We have water power. We have all the former, the infrastructure that's needed to operate the mine, being that it is a brownfield operation that was operating as recently as April of 2020. Uh, we have um, it in the location. As you can see, it's proximal to the ocean. There's a ton of infrastructure here. Um, as you zoom in, um, we are looking at four different deposits that would feed the mine. And traditionally, that's, that's how the mine was off, that the plant was fed with uh, various sources of ore in the past. And we're going to continue doing that. Um, we, the, the, I think the centerpiece of this whole operation really is the very capable uh, crush grind flotation mill that is located on the mine. It, it, uh, it, it, it obviously is a good performing mill. It was invested in and operated by Glencore for about eight years. And it has extra capacity, I think is really the point here. So as we develop, as we get the mines ready, um, we do have extra capacity that we will look towards in the future in terms of filling it. But we're gonna start off um, 
um, in a very sound manner and a measured approach for about 3,200 tons per day. And we can, we can look at increasing the tonnage through the mine and through the mill at, at a later date. We have tailings ponds, um, we, have, uh, we have permits, we're essentially uh, almost ready to go here. So a little bit of um, why did we acquire this? How did we come upon this? Um, the, the, the Punataki mine was started by Tamaya Resources uh, a few back in 2007, started and stopped. Glencore came in and bought it out of bankruptcy, finished applying capital to the operation and got it going and ran it for eight years. Um, along the way, Glencore outgrew the operation. As you can imagine, this is 20 to 25 million pounds. Um, they just simply outgrew it. So they, they looked for a uh, buyer, Zeana Mining came in, bought it while it was operating and ran it for about 18 months and had to shut it down due to lack of cash. Now, uh, Zeana had a good idea that they would pay for the acquisition and the working capital needed for the mine through cash flow. But unfortunately, they found themselves in a severely declining copper market and they just ran out of cash at the end. Of course, COVID didn't help either. Um, so um, I think when they closed it down, copper was at about $2.10, but that provided an opportunity for us to come in and acquire this at the asset level. So we are developing the mine right now. Uh, we started a drill program back in, uh, in August of 2021. Um, that program is exploration and infill drilling. We're doing engineering, we're modifying existing permits, and all of this has come to come together in a technical report that we hope to have out around May of this year. Now that will be the decision point for the investment to restart uh, the mine. So we will be funding this and starting it. And within about nine to 12 months, we should be seeing um, uh, ore through the mill. And that is our goal to, uh, to start producing copper through the mill by the end of the year. Uh, it is in a great prolific area in terms of geology. We have uh, both uh, Manto style and IOCG style deposits on our claims. This is a 25 kilometer trend that the mine is located in. Um, our claims are indicated in the gold boxes on the right. Other people's claims are in between. And you know, there's about four different uh, privately owned uh, operating mines right now. There's several exploration projects going on in the area. We just have a, a lot of commercial opportunities here, both um, and also opportunities on our own claims. So we're very excited. As I said, we are in a drilling program here. We've had great success so far, and we're getting towards the end of that program so that we can um, inform the new resource statement that's coming out in May. Um, whenever you see our press releases and you see anything bigger than a three meter intercept, anything more than 0.8% copper, that's a real win for us because that really is the lower end of the of the economic limit that we see in terms of uh, um, viable copper intercepts. So when you see results like this, uh, like you see here, that's a very good win for us. We're drilling at uh, in three different deposits right now, and we look forward to developing all three of them uh, to feed the mill. This is just another view of that 25 kilometer trend. And just to drive home the point that we are in the middle of a very prolific mining area with infrastructure, labor, suppliers, um, all the things that we need to get going. Um, and we do have a presence along this trend with our very capable mill being the centerpiece of this whole trend. We are the only uh, capable sulfide flotation mill in the entire region. And we look forward to perhaps leveraging that in the future. Great. Martin, I'll just ask you to start to wrap it up only because we have some questions. Yes, here. let's do it. The time and I wanna make sure we have time for our audience questions. Okay, well, I, I just, uh, if I have a couple minutes, I'd just like to say that, yes, I think really let's just conclude because there's, there's a lot more to talk about, but I'd like to just get to the point is that our focus, although we have a lot of assets, um, we, we think that's a, a plus for us because our focus right now is cash flow first and then develop the other assets as we get going. We don't want to perpetually be coming back to the shareholders to develop these things. So we're using Punataki as a platform to build a company. And that's really what those other assets will contribute in the future. Excellent. Thank you, Martin. Great one to follow up on uh, Buru. I mean, a similar story in the sense that, you know, being very timely in the marketplace and being able to pick up the stress assets when copper is at two bucks and look where we are now, four bucks and only going much higher. I think we can all agree from here. So pretty shrewd piece of business on your part. Um, first question here comes from uh, John in the audience. He says, good morning. And he says, he'd like to get your thoughts on emerging ESG commitments and water management. 
Which okay. Is thank, you yeah, no, thank you, John. That's, that's a good question. We, you know, we have a, a I, I would consider a very strong social license in the region because we've, the, the mine has been a presence there for over nine years. Um, people raise families working at the mine. And we have, uh, we found that there's been good relationships established with the community and also uh, the regulators there. There is some talk. Uh, it, we're in a we're in a very uh, prolific area in terms of agriculture, and so water usage is is um, a big topic. We are part of a cooperative that that has license to uh, to use the water, and um, and we look forward to working with them to continue uh, to get things going at the mine and continue to be responsible citizens of that community. Excellent. Thank you, Martin. Another one picking up on ESG from Trevor. Uh, you've covered off some of the question, but he does ask specifically, um, Chile, is there any pending legislation around ESG? Yeah, well, I think I think one of the bigger things is that there's a couple of topics out there. I'll try and be brief. Um, one, one is the use of land around, around Aboriginal um, title, and the other is there's going to be a renewed focus on water. Obviously, Chile's uh, um, you know, the, the water is sometimes scarce in, in Chile. Um, we have, we're fortunate to be an area that has lots of water and we're part of a, an organized cooperative that, that allocates water for various businesses. And in terms of um, encroaching or, or having any kind of issues with uh, native lands, um, there are none in our area. So I, I think for us, uh, I think for Chile, they're moving into the sort of the, the steps that other countries have already taken and that's great. For us, um, there should be no effect in, in terms of our operations. Okay, excellent. Um, I do want to, we are over and I want to keep us marching along to be fair to the other presenters. I do want to get one last quick question in here. Mohammed and Fernando, we will, Laura, can you get their questions and uh, we'll get them over to Martin because we won't have time for those. They're more around the battery side and because your uh, presentation was more focused on uh, the copper, I'm going to go with this question around copper. Sure. Um, he's... Uh, an audience member here is wondering about the, with regards, I guess, to the flotation plant on site, can it handle different sources of ore? Absolutely. Um, it was designed to do that. And, and historically over the nine years, um, it, there was never just a single source of ore for the plant. And so it's, it's a matter of uh, organizing yourself and making sure you, you keep a, a proper blend into the plant. And I mean, that's the trick of operating a flotation plant is consistent feed. So stockpiling and ore control are very important aspects of, of uh, executing that appropriately. But yes, it'll handle other ores. Okay, excellent, Martin. Very well done. Excellent presentation. We thank you for the time and sharing with us. It's one we will definitely be watching going forward. We wish you continued success. Have a great rest of the year. Nice meeting with you. Thanks for having me. Take care. Bye-bye.